Jerry, Bonnie, Annette, and the MDI Biological Laboratory for having us here tonight. It's such an honor to be gathered in this place and sharing a little bit of our story in this incredible place where so much discovery is happening and kind of feel it sort of seeping from the walls here. So we are, we are juiced tonight. So before we get started, we'd like to do something with all of you that we do with children in our school programs. Are you game? Sure. Yes. So what we'd like to do is just take a moment to celebrate wonder and gratitude. So one of the things we do with the kids, and you guys all know this because I know there are a lot of scientists here, that plants produce much of the oxygen that we breathe. But what, what a lot of you know, and some of you might not know, is that about half of the oxygen comes from phytoplankton. And we love plankton. We have a plankton thing. So these exquisite microscopic plants in the ocean, diatoms, they look like green gold jewels under the microscope, produce about half of the oxygen we breathe. And we'd love to celebrate that with kids and really experience that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take in a deep breath together. Are you ready? And we're going to let it out. And another breath. So every other breath, that oxygen is made by phytoplankton. So can you join us all in saying thank you, phytoplankton? Are you ready? Thank you, phytoplankton. wondrous world we live in. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. We'd like to share three things with you to get our conversation started. So we're going to each talk a little bit about how science inspires us a little bit, our collaboration on our children's books, The Secret Pool, which is about vernal pools, and The Secret Bay, which is about estuaries. And then we're going to talk a little bit about our school programs. We'll end by taking you on a little, I think two, we're going to take you on two short field trips to end. And we're very excited to hear your questions and comments and experiences after that. So we'll get started. So I grew up in Maine, many, many generations back in southern Maine, a little town called Springville. I grew up on the rural outskirts. I was very lucky to have a free-range childhood. I roamed the same landscape my dad and his family did from way back. And my two favorite hangouts, when it was rainy, I was in the library. And when it wasn't rainy, I was in the woods. And one spring day, I heard this mysterious sound, kind of like ducks, kind of faintly up in the woods. So I went up in the woods, followed the sound, and came to this very pool behind my parents' house. No ducks, nothing. But I kind of looked, and I could see little frogs moving around and I could see eggs, and this became a wondrous, incredible place to me. This was one of my hangouts. It was great because it was out of eyesight, but within earshot. So when it was time for dinner, I could hear my mother, but she couldn't see me. So I kind of hung out here and looked at frog eggs, tadpoles, butterflies, flowers. I was a dreamy kid. The kids on my street called me Mother Nature. It was not a compliment. So I couldn't hear. And so one day I went back to my pool and it had dried up. It was just a mud puddle and I was horrified. I was probably nine or ten. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened to the tadpoles? What happened to all the little insects and the life in that pool? And I was kind of rummaging around in the leaf litter. And before I went out, by the way, my mother would say two things to me. Don't get wet. Don't get your feet wet because I was always getting colds. Don't get your feet wet and don't get muddy. And guess what I did? <laughs> Both of those things, I got my feet wet and muddy. So I was concerned what had happened, and I was kind of sitting on the edge of this pool, and all of a sudden, these little teeny frogs, the size of my thumbnail, froglets, popping all around me. And I later learned these are wood frogs, and they're my favorite frog. We have nine kinds of frogs in Maine, and I love Wood frogs, I think of them as super frogs because they can live farther north than any other frog in the world. They can live, they live even uh, almost up to the Arctic Circle. They survive winter in an amazing way. 
they crawl under the leaf litter, just a very thin blanket of dead leaves, and they freeze almost solid. They turn into frogsicles. <laughs> and Rebecca, you saw you saw something happening in the woods. I was just on a, a walk in the autumn. The leaves were beautiful, colors around, just a path. And I saw this little bit of movement, and I looked closer, and I saw this little wood frog. First front legs under the leaf, then the back scooted under, and then a little wiggle, and then the leaves covered the entirely. And I was so worried for the rest of the walk. So they're all, these frogs are all around us in the spring, when it rains, it gets between 45, 50 degrees, these guys thaw out and they hop straight back to their vernal pools to mate and lay their eggs and the sound, you probably have heard them, is kind of like a quacking duck and that's a great way to find yourselves a vernal pool. I see a lot of nods here, Rebecca, these are our people. <laughs> yes, so, so from the people, so the people are like, what are you talking about? So from day one, I always fell deeply in love with the natural world, and we're going to fast forward a few years here. <laughs> and so as a kid, I would write poems about nature. This is a, from a poetry poems I wrote in seventh grade, illustrated there I am with my cat fluff. <laughs> and um, many years later, I became a journalist and uh, earned a master's degree in science journalism at Boston University. So I have uh, made work out of writing about science and nature, starting uh, writing about grown-ups. I write quite a bit for Down East, wildlife, bird migration. I'm a birder, and we had this incredible stopover habitat here in Maine along the coast and the islands, farming, sea smoke. And then finally I caught on and realized it's time to write for children. So that's been a fairly recent endeavor and a real joy. So meanwhile, back in Tennessee, <laughs> I'm originally from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and my mother was a bacteriologist, and my father an art director for an advertising agency. So I'm the oldest of five children, and being the oldest, and any time I wanted to find peace and quiet, I would travel down to our backyard to this little stream and look for crawdaddies and tur box turtles around and I was known as the turtle <coughs> girl. I could find them. I wish I could remember how I found them now, but I was always finding the box turtle. And as I said, my mother, being in science, it was coming home not to find cookies or muffins yeah. on the counter. It was microscopes. So I would see these microscopes, see what she was looking at, and then in the next room would be my father in his studio working under his long fluorescent light and doing these amazing drawings. And I sort of had that balance of science and art. And if I fell and skinned my knee, my mama would say things like, Honey, oh, don't worry, it's just a little hematoma. It was <laughs> <laughs> that kind of world that I loved it. And so the science and the art was very natural for me in learning about these creatures of the world. And in this, to come back to this drawing, my father, uh, I used to pose for him. I was about seven or eight years old. And when I would watch him draw, it was just like, magic on, mm -hmm. on the lines on paper and I said I wanted to do that too. Mm -hmm. And this was when I always show the children that I was in about second grade and I went to the circus and I fell in love with the woman who could dance on the back of the horse that would go around, she would do flips and all these beautiful movements and these that's how I what I have, it might be, um, 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 but I'm not sure, and, but everyone was enjoying, and I want to show the children that I just kept on working, and this is a painting of a female bear that was in our backyard coming early spring, so I'm just encouraged to keep on, keep on the practice. So we met about 20 years ago, maybe? 
Um, and as Rebecca says, we relate. <coughs> so we had talked for many years about this dream of writing and illustrating a children's book together about the natural world. So we would go on walks together and talk about this. And by the way, long before I met Rebecca, I saw her art. It was a sculpture of a sleeping rabbit at the Leighton Gallery in Blue Hill. And you know how when you go in an art gallery, you're not supposed to touch anything. <laughs> and I knew this. But I could not. My hands went right on that rabbit because it was the most soulful, exquisite, like the soul of a rabbit. And um, a word our editor has used that's really a guiding premise for us when we write and make our art for kids and work with kids is beinghood. The beinghood. And I really feel so honored to go and work with Rebecca and because her work really captures that deep essence. It's anatomically correct, it's interpreted, but there's something to me very profound and soulful about her work. Yeah. Well, I, I read a lot of Kim's work before and fell in love with her writing. I had not met her, but I did know her husband, Tom Curry, an amazing painter, and we were very good friends, and he kept saying, you've got to meet my wife. You, you're going to love her. You're going to be great friends. And so over time, we finally did meet, and when we go on walks, it's a non-aerobic. <laughs> oh my God! Just the other day, we saw the most wonderful praying mantis, and, and we marveled <coughs> over it. And it, it was so much fun to have a friend that will love something as much and share that love and fascination and wonder with. And so, as time went on, we say, "Oh, if I could only illustrate something that we would write." And normally, with publishers, the writer never meets the illustrator. And, and, uh, and other books that I worked on with Tilbury House, the publisher, um, I never did meet until the last book came, and we had Barnes & Noble book signing together, Alan Sockett, <coughs> with Thanks to the Animals. And so, Kim and I, we just dreamed about it. And then one day I got courage enough to ask, I'm sure I felt comfortable enough to say, do you have any good nature stories that you might have me in mind that I might illustrate? Actually, we'd like you to collaborate with Kim Ridley. Do you know her? It was a dream come true. It was a true dream come true. And I can visually see so much of her writing, and, and you will too when you read her work. And um, so finally, we get together and we go to Tilbury House for a meeting. Not one, but three editors we met with sat with us, and we just, Kim had ideas that she wanted to pitch. So the first book about Vernal Pools, The Secret Pool, came out. <coughs> the one they really got excited about. And that was the last pitch, too. So we're like, how about this? How about we had all these ideas of Vernal Pools, and we, we were thrilled. So um, we started on the writing process. So again, I had all this experience with Vernal Pools before I quite knew what they were. And I worked with scientists at the University of Maine at Orono, um, helping them with communications and writing um, at the George Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions. This is Dr. Aram Calhoun, who some of you may know. She's an expert on amphibians, vernal pools, and in working with Dr. Calhoun, that was the real catalyst that made me decide I really want to write about these places for kids. Um, so that really got me going. And we both worked with Dr. Calhoun, making sure both the writing and the art were accurate. So we collaborate actively with scientists on our kids' books. So the thing I learned from Dr. Calhoun that really struck me is that not only are vernal pools necessary breeding habitats for these critters, you might recognize this is a spotted salamander, so gorgeous. I love the way Rebecca describes uh, the salamanders having a Mona Lisa smile. When you look at it, head on, um, incredible creatures, and kids, kids love them. And I learned, I learned from, we learned from children, by the way, that one of our school visits, one of the kids said, well, how come the spots are yellow? 
And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've never thought of that. And did the research because yellow is a warning sign in nature. And these guys do produce a bitter tasting toxin, which I never knew even after writing the book. And then these are fairy shrimp. Um, which are marvelous. Um, we have some in a vernal pool in Sedgwick that we found on a school visit. Uh, these guys are amazing. These are their eggs right here. They're about the size of a poppy seed. I just can't resist telling you this little story. How fairy shrimp can only live in vernal pools. So how do they spread from pool to pool to pool? They can't survive outside of water. Does anybody know? It's their eggs. Their eggs are called cysts. They're sticky. So when a duck, migratory birds, or a mammal come to a vernal pool to feed or have a drink, the eggs, the cysts, stick to their feet or their legs. So the eggs hitchhike, and that's how fairy shrimp spread from pool to pool. And these eggs, by the way, can last more than 15 years before hatching, oh, freezing. So quite marvelous. And they, these guys are around us. So. Uh, vernal pools, all of these animals need vernal pools to lay their eggs, but I learned from Dr. Calhoun that these places produce tons of protein. They're one of the most productive ecosystems in the forest, even though some of these pools are very small. So that made me think we really need kids to know what these places are, these wondrous places all around us. Um, so that really, really got us going. So, a big decision I had to make when I wrote The Secret Pool, because I didn't want the book to be, I didn't want it to be didactic. I didn't want it to be preachy. I wanted it to be exciting and interesting. So I had to figure out how on earth am I going to write, and I was all excited, and I'm like, oh my god, how am I going to do it? <laughs> so I spent a lot of time observing these pools, and I decided that the pool would tell its own story in a year of its life. So I'm like, oh my goodness, how do I channel a vernal pool? And what I decided is that my pool was going to have some attitude because it's small and overlooked, but it's very potent and powerful. And I decided to give it a lyrical voice because to me, water is very poetic. So the story opens a shimmer, a twinkling. Do you have any inkling of what I am? Even if you are lucky enough, find me shining on the forest floor on an early spring day, you might mistake me for a puddle, which I most certainly am not. <laughs> and so the book goes on from there with the pool telling its own story. And so it was coming along, but then I thought, gosh, there's so much about vernal pools that I want kids to know. So what I decided to do on every spread after that is to actually write this book in two voices. So in every spread, there's a sidebar, informational text, because I wanted kids to be able to take this book outside and learn about the pools, how to tell the eggs apart, how to identify the organisms, and really learn about the ecology. So both The Secret Pool and our second book, The Secret Bay, are written in two voices, um, so kids and their grown-ups can have a really full experience of the world around us. And of course, a picture book is very much about the art. And what I say to kids is great writing in the workshops, you want to paint pictures with words. But then, you want to tell more of a story with art. I have to tell you, the exciting day when I get a manuscript, the story in my hands, and the publisher, still, though Kim and I are friends, Kim will send the manuscript for editing and then I finally get it, and I take that manuscript and read it over and over. And for me, I read it into a tape player, tape recorder, and I play it back over and over and over, and the images start to come. But I have a tremendous amount of questions. I had never drawn a yellow spotted salamander, or a female wood frog, or a male wood frog, and I had never drawn mosquitoes. So I, my whole dream and hope that children with a natural science curiosity that they already have realize that wonder comes first, then that, oh, but what does he eat? Where does he live? And the environment they live in comes next, those questions lead to the interpretation. So this, 
that's the science and the art for me. And for instance, midges, mosquitoes, and big green head flies buzz up from my mud and into the sky. <coughs> Just a smidge of warm blood is what they must find to lay billions of eggs and make more of their kind. <laughs> Can you see that image? I mean, each one of us would have our own interpretation if we were just hearing those words. But I knew after reading more about these creatures, even the mosquitoes and the lark, and, and adding more to the picture to help tell more of the story, I wanted to include, you know, I don't appreciate any by the fly, so I've exaggerated the, just a little bit. I wanted you to recognize it. That's one of my licenses as the artist. And the, the kinds of grasses that would be the spartina and, and the core grasses, I had to learn those things. I had to do my own research too. And of course, these purple martin, the eastern kingbird. And the trees follow. I had to know more about them, not only what they look like, but and where they live. And it was an incredible gift to see. I get to see the illustrations. Oh, yes. She has Rebecca yes. did them. And it literally it was like getting a present. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, what is she gonna it was like, how could anybody do anything with mosquitoes <laughs> and greenhead flies? And just I love the story that's happening here. The sidebar is about how the importance of these insects is that they're bird food. And just how Rebecca composed this and really tells a narrative and a story. And is this the original? Yes, this is yeah. the, I was gonna say this is the original from the book, and um, I had to be aware in the design process as an illustrator to be aware of that center, the gutter of the book, a place for the words. Don't put anything important, that eye or the nose or anything in the face right in the middle. So placing the objects in the design was important to express. So after we did our, we wrote, created our books, I assumed after the first book, I wrote The Secret Pool, oh, very nice, and then go back to my quiet little life. Rebecca, you go back to your studio. Then Island Readers and Writers, Jan Coates from Island Readers and Writers, who some of you may know, dear, wonderful yes. Jan, asked, invited us to do a school program. And I was terrified. I hadn't been in an elementary school classroom since Nixon was president, <laughs> but uh, I knew I'd be going with my dear friend Rebecca, and so we did, we've done a bunch of work with Island Readers and Writers through their Literary Links to Science program, and it's such a joy. We feel so lucky to work with them, and so that really got us started on working together, and we'd like to share with you just a little peek of our, our school programs and what it is, our, our mission and goals. Um, so just a few images. So what we want to do in our school programs is bring together science, writing, and art. And as Rebecca said, kids are natural scientists. They're also writers and artists. So one of the things we really emphasize in our programs, and as we say, we've been, we, we work mostly in Maine elementary schools, but around the Northeast, we like to say we've been from Acton to Jackman. <laughs> so we've had some wonderful adventures in elementary schools ongoing. Um, but we talk with kids, well, what do scientists, writers, and artists, what could they possibly have in common that they do for their jobs? And it's at least three things. So we work with the kids on this. So scientists, writers, and artists all observe, carefully study, observe. They all do research. They ask questions and seek answers. And then scientists, writer, writers, and artists all use their imaginations to form a hypothesis, to make a drawing, to write a piece of a poem or a piece of prose. So we feel that we try to break down these walls and put it all together. They're separate disciplines, but they have much in common. And Rebecca, feel, feel free to chime in, but we were talking about this. What is it we hope to accomplish? 
and it's really sharing our love of the literal magic of the living world all around us in our backyards, at our feet, up in the air. Engage kids in this, in the science, by using art and writing as a way to get in. So as the kids are creating, which you'll see in a moment, they're getting their science and they're learning it because they're using it to express their knowledge and their learning and their joy and what excites them. Do you want to? Do you want to add to that? I just want to say that the dream of making a, a norm, the norm, for all children to feel to take what they already have that that curiosity and that discovery and that wonder to keep on research and ask those questions and, and then find ways to share and express, but mostly to find empathy with those things around around us and. The more you learn, the more you love, and the more you want to share and protect what you love. So that is our main yes. thing. Yep. Very inspired by John Burroughs, who yes. says that knowledge follows love. So I think that's a very powerful idea. So this, this is uh, our assembly. We start our school programs with a school-wide assembly. Um, that's a mini lesson on the ecology of either vernal pools or estuaries. And then the kids do writing workshops with me and art workshops with Rebecca. And these are fabulous stick sets that Rebecca made. You can see some of them here. He's the prisoner. He's the and you can see the phytoplankton, the diatom. <laughs> and the sun, the sun, which gets it all going. And our brackish water estuary. So at the end, we have young volunteers join us and help celebrate estuaries by creating an estuary food chain. So that's how we get things rolling. And then the kids do writing workshops with me, combining research and imagination. So I have little fact sheets for them, uh, grade appropriate. They do a little research, they have photographs, and then I lead them in writing a short piece of prose with writing prompts. And then when they're done with their writing, and it's a writing workshop, kids share, and one thing that's important for me personally is for every child to contribute and feel heard and know that they can create. And I know it's the same um, for Rebecca in your illustration workshops. After they come to Kimberly, they will come to me with a segment of their writing, something very special that they really feel strongly about through their whole process of writing with Ms. Kimberly. And they will pick their character, a fairy shrimp, for instance, or um, a monkey jug, or the horseshoe crab. And, and uh, I will demonstrate, just with simple tools, the importance of drawing and the contour and really observing. And for instance, I, I do a simple technique of drawing and using the graphite. Uh, Bringing out and giving contrast, and then having light come with a needed eraser. And then the most important thing that I love to show the children is every living thing has that sparkle of light. And every time you look at each other, that sparkle of light in the eyes. And especially for illustration, you open up the book, you want that character to really come out and feel alive to you. So I always work with a little bundle of light. And after I do the demonstrations, the children, uh, I ask them to come up for a name for that to ins hopefully instill more empathy. They come up with names, and this one was Bob the Mummy Chug. <laughs> oh, and his friend Eddie. So <laughs> We actually, we have to say we love, can we have a mummy child moment, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that we ask, and I know our lab is studying killifish, so mummy chogs are kind of killifish, they're common in estuaries, and we ask the kids, we say these little three inch long fish, about three inches long or so, um, they do something, that something that they do helps human beings. And so we ask the kids, and I wonder if anybody knows, any ideas about how a mummy chog, these little fish, could possibly help human beings? Any ideas? Any ideas? Well, they have big appetites, these little fish. 
fish, and what they love to eat are mosquito larvae. <laughs> so one mummy chow can eat 2,000 mosquito larvae a day. I don't know who studied this, but I've seen it cited in the literature, and people actually, some places will use mummy chugs for mosquito control. So it gets back to appreciating the world around us, empathy, the sparkle in the eye, our relationships between all these creatures, the ecology, and each other. And then at the end of the day, we invite the kids, we put it all together, because we love, we want our programs to be about mutual learning and exchange and celebration. So at the end of the day, we have pool of learning gallery walks. So we have these tarps, that's our pool or our bay, and the kids display what they've created in their work, writing and illustration workshops. And we have conversation about it. What do you notice? What did you learn today? What new questions do you have? So at the end of the day, we really try to put all of this together and integrate it. And we talk about, you know, back to inciting wonder, what are the things we really hope to accomplish? Inspiration, inspiring kids to connect and explore with the place that's right around us, right in their backyards. And we want to engage them in inquiry and self-directed learning. You can read stuff, you can look stuff up for yourself. What are you curious about? And finally, encourage them to share what they learn through their writing and art, so expression. And now, we'd like to take you on a little field trip up to Washington County. Are you game for that? Sure. It's beautiful up there. And I think, is there somebody? Oh, the, well, I think I can take yours. I might be a little bigger, so. Let's see, somebody, somebody will help me. Oh, oh. Washington County and collaborated with educational institutions, County Salmon. Um, so this is a peek at what we do. Oh sure, maybe we'll take you out to the islands first. <laughs> <laughs> the main island. <laughs> Let's go out to the... And in this trip that we're taking on, it was based on students for studying the secret pool yeah, of Alberta. There's a synergy that is created by the bringing together of a reader, an author, in a setting that a child is comfortable in. One of the commitments we made very early on was to take these programs to children where they live. We ignite curiosity, stretch imaginations with our programs. When we do this, we're opening up worlds. They all start with a great story um, that we find, and we bring that story to life. And it takes everybody. And we're so, we feel so lucky and honored to be part of it. It changed my life 
reading books, being outside. And there's one more. Do you are you up for a trip to Washington County? Okay. Yeah. Trip? okay. <laughs> this was um, an LS program. Uh, and you'll see at the end it was Downey's Salmon Federation, several organizations. So in this the kids wrote, made art, and then actually got to go out and work with alewives and learn some science. Say we're 
were new here. We've been here almost 40 years. My husband did research here for many years. And now in retirement, we're very involved with Island Readers and Writers. And I want to thank both of you for the impact you have had because we have visited Fields Island. We've been to Jonesport. We've been to Frenchboro. And you cannot imagine the impact that the visits of these wonderful people have had upon the children in those schools. These young people are learning that they have opportunities for careers that they never dreamed of. Uh, scientists in this lab help them learn about science up in Jonesport. Uh, the work that you have done, and Rebecca, when you had this wonderful one morning in Maine recently with the children, it is so deeply touching to think of what you have done uh, for the children, not only of this, of uh, the outer island, but what we call inland islands up in Washington County, uh, but throughout this area of the country. So I just want to thank you so much for that. And to tell you, after even after your visit, uh, to go to Beals Island and spend time with Chris Crowley and those wonderful teachers and those children, to see that they still love to talk about you and what you all had to, have your impact on their lives. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, they're, you probably know, they produce incredible, this whole cornucopia 
of chemicals, so, and, you know, um, antibacterials, and all kinds of incredibly sophisticated compounds because they, they're stationary. But I think one of my favorite sponge facts is that if you take a piece of sea sponge and put it in a blender and chop it up or through a sieve and then pour it back into seawater, the cells will, they'll put themselves back together. They'll make little oh, mini wow. sponges, which is like, holy oh, sponge. <laughs> yeah, is that crazy? So, I'll stop, I'll stop there. Yeah.
Yeah. Curiosity and questions. Yeah. Uh, so many kids of the age to whom you're, uh, to whom you're teaching are involved with digital devices. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested in what sort of feedback you may have had from them in presenting them an alternative to staring at a screen. Uh, yeah. They, um, we do get feedback from island readers and writers. They actually survey the kids and they fill out forms. Um, and I think that kids, one thing that kids said is, um, one kid said he was really excited to go out and look for the real animals <laughs> rather than always sitting at a screen. So that was exciting. I was just going to say, getting out in nature as much as possible. Yes. And, um, there's a camp that I've heard about that no, uh, no phones, no, no laptops, anything is allowed for two weeks. And it was, they came back so excited to just tell them what they'd seen and what they'd done. So I just was so yeah. And they, 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 yeah, they engage quickly. Once in a while for the writing piece, kids will want to use their iPads their laptops for research. For, re for research, but what I've done just to, I just, I bring fact sheets for the, you know, age uh, grade appropriate, um, and really ask them to handwrite. And um, I show them my secret writing tool. Do you want to be a writer? <laughs> your most important two tools. You keep a notebook in your back pocket with a pencil. So whether you want to write fiction, nonfiction, so you can write it down. And then I give them another, my other favorite writing secret, which is make sure you empty your pants pockets before you put them in the washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we really try in our, in our um, workshops to unplug. So too, thank you for that question. We try to make space to really unplug for the day. Richard Blue, you, you oh, yes. okay, Lost so Child in the Woods. Is that, yeah. is that you're, you're, the children you're working with through this program seem eager to get out and yes. experience? Yes. Is that yes. less of a problem? Is that a benefit of being in Maine, perhaps? What a great question. Mm -hmm. I know, I think anytime kids have the opportunity anywhere, there's an outside place, they want to get outdoors. And that's something we talk about. We wish we had more time. Sometimes we do work with kids outside and really enjoy that. But you know, you'd be surprised. Here we are in this rural state, in these rural communities. Um, we were down in Scarborough. And it was so uh, we did, we worked with uh, 600 kids in Scarborough, K through two, three schools. And one of the teachers came up to us and said, thank you so much. A lot of, because of the beautiful Scarborough marshes there, exquisite estuary. And the teacher Thank you. A lot of these kids in this beautiful community are afraid of going outside. Uh, they're afraid of, and it's legitimate ticks, obviously, deer ticks. It's really scary. It's bad. But they're afraid of coyotes. Um, so there's a, there is actually a lot of, I don't know so much in this area, but um, the teacher was, was very strong about that. He said kids are afraid. Sometimes kids are afraid of going outside. And there are legitimate dangers, but... I heard of a teacher in the cities that would just in the parking lot, in the backyard in, in the city, in New York City, that, that would take the kids out and with a book like something like this and do a foot square and yes. of, of area. And what they would see are make a trail of peanut butter and see what happens and, and, and cool. things like that. So. Especially in cities, so mm -hmm. I love to think of these books that children that may not get to see a burn of wool or may not get to go to an estuary. I'm not sure what an estuary is, but that those kind of things of learning that I, I do think is possible. Mm -hmm. It's in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> is there a question here? kids to get excited to go to the next step, like the Citizen Science Project. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 You know, yes. What yes. creatures are, the population yes. counts, temperatures, literature, yes. whatever. Science teach, number of science teachers are running, so after we visit 
are running with it, um, Bev at the Sedgwick School, yes, and so they're really, they have a significant vernal pool on the school property. It has fairy shrimp in it, and it's the first place we've ever seen fairy shrimp around here. So quite a few teachers do continue with this. Yeah, 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 thank you. And do you have a question? Uh, just a comment that um, my partner used to do environmental education at the Oakland Museum, oh, cool. and she worked with kids who had practically no experience with nature but the, the natural environment that they were familiar with were these little bitty parks that had needles in them and you know, trash on the yeah, hillsides, yeah, right. and they like part of the block. And so they took one of those and they studied it and they cleaned it up and they looked at um, the life and the cool. interrelationships of things in that park and the kids could relate to that. Yes. It, where they, you know, this would be too far away for them. Yes, um, yeah. They would get here eventually, but yeah. it was very successful. I think that's, an, that's really an important point, and we, we talk about that. Um, it's, these books are really powerful on the coast, and, in, and it's, we, it's really powerful when we can connect kids with their surroundings, with their environment, and to see you know kids up in um, Jonesport just so proud, and they have so much knowledge that they can share, because their dads fish, um, they've grown up in these communities, so it's very rich when we can connect, when kids can connect with their place. Yeah. Yeah. Do you uh, do anything on encourage poetry? Yes. Yeah. We so in the writing workshops, kids have their <coughs> choice. They can either write a short piece of prose or a poem, and we talk about that. Some kids want to write. We do haikus. So uh, we've had kids do estuary haikus, which are really fabulous about all of the different animals. So yep. And we depending on the grade level and what the teachers are interested. But we do work with poetry as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. It's really good.